Welcome to Inspired Edinburgh, the home of powerful conversations. I'm Elliot Reeves and my guest today is Josh Littlejohn, MBE. Josh is a speaker, philanthropist and one of the UK's leading social entrepreneurs, having raised over £7 million for charity and significantly impacting the issue of homelessness in Scotland. In 2011, you set up the Scottish Business Awards, the largest awards dinner of its kind in the whole of the UK, featuring keynote speakers such as Sir Bob Geldof, Leonardo DiCaprio, George Clooney, Sir Richard Branson and former US President Bill Clinton. In 2012, you co-founded Social Bite, a social enterprise with a mission to eradicate homelessness in Scotland. 100% of profits are donated to good causes and one in four of your staff are people from homeless backgrounds. In 2016, you co-founded Brewgooder, a beer company that donates all profits to clean water projects around the world. Your mission is to provide clean drinking water for one million people within five years. In 2017, you were given an MBE in the New Year's Honours List. You received two honorary doctorates and you also made the Debrett's List of 500 most influential people in the UK. 2017 also saw you organise the first Sleep in the Park, the world's biggest sleep out event, which drew more than 8,000 people and was followed in 2018 across four cities with a turnout of 12,000. In May 2018, the Social Bike Village was officially launched in Edinburgh to provide housing for homeless people and in late June, you welcomed your first residence. Josh, it's an honour and a privilege to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. <laughs> it's an absolute <laughs> pleasure. You don't do anything by halves, do you, Josh? No, I'm exhausted just listening <laughs> to that. Um, but no, sir, like Social Bite was only set up um, six and a half years ago. So, uh, you know, hearing all that back, I just think what a whirlwind it's been. Absolutely. Uh, really, but yeah. Um, uh, you, you seem like a very sort of humble, uh, poised individual. I mean, how does hearing that make you feel? Um, I think some it's a this kind of entrepreneurship thing, and I've sort of gone down this social entrepreneurship route. Um, it's very addictive, um, so sometimes you don't stop uh, and really take stock, and you're kind of always yeah. on to the next thing, and you're always kind of after the a bigger hit. You know? <laughs> so it's kind of um, yeah. Sometimes you do take stock a bit, and you kind of think you know you get key milestones. So like the village opening was a big moment um, for me personally. Uh, and for social bite, um, or the big sleep outs, and you get key kind of milestones where you sort of take stock a bit. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you're not all back. Yeah, it's certainly been a whirlwind. It's been a really, you know, incredible experience, uh, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So, what would you say is your proudest achievement? Um, hmm, I think that uh, I think first I'm proud that I've like managed to kind of stumble or navigate myself onto a path that I kind of feel. Um, is really connected with who I am as a person. I mm -hmm. think like one of my biggest fears, I suppose, in life when I was coming to the age of trying to go into the workplace and trying to find my way in the world is that would I would have kind of ended up, um, you know, doing something that I wasn't really passionate about, or kind of ended up, you know, doing a bit of a career, you know, on a certain uh, path that wasn't really I didn't really identify with. Mm -hmm. um, so I think took me a little bit of time. I left university and decided to set up my own business. Um, and that was an events company, um, which didn't really have much of a social mission to it at all. It was uh, just to try and make a profit really. And we came up with these different event ideas and we started organizing different events. Um, and it was only, I was, trying to, I was almost feeling my way in the world, just trying to clutch on to something that I felt I'm more identified with. And when I came across this more the social business model, um, I read a book by a guy called Professor Muhammad Yunus, mm -hmm. and he described this idea of a social business where in Bangladesh you'd set up over 50 different companies and some of them went on to become billion dollar businesses, but he never owned a single share in any one of them. Um, okay. So his motivation was never one to make a financial gain personally or for shareholders, it was always to make a social difference by using a business format. So suddenly, I thought, wow, this is kind of an idea that I can grasp onto. Yeah. Uh, and then that led to us setting up Social Bite, uh, myself and Alice, and we opened up this little sandwich shop, but we weren't 100% clear what the social mission would be um, and uh, ended up kind of very, almost by accident, uh, becoming t focused on the homeless issue mm -hmm. because a young guy called Pete, uh, who was 19 years old and he was homeless and he was selling the big issue magazine on the street corner just outside the shop he kind of uh, plucked up the courage and asked us for a job. Um, so we decided, man, why not? And we gave him a job and that kind of led us down this 
uh, path of, of focusing on this issue of homelessness. So mm -hmm. I suppose my proudest thing really is just that I managed to kind of feel my way to a place where I feel almost completely aligned and um, with who I felt I, what I am and what I was as a person with what I'm doing every day. Um, and I think that's probably a very rare thing and I'm uh, certainly aware of how lucky. Um, I, I certainly feel really lucky to to, to have that sense of alignment. So I'm proud that, like, you know, I kind of feel I'm on uh, the path that's right for me. Yeah, absolutely. It's very uh, profound oh, thank you. For, a, for a young guy. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me a bit about, you know, your, your early life. I mean, where you grew up and what that, you may, maybe the sort of influence that's had on you as a person. Yeah, um, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, again, I've had a really lucky childhood a really lucky upbringing um, I grew up n just near Stirling uh, close to Blair Drummond Safari Park um, my dad was in the restaurant business so he set up his own restaurant called Little John's um, when I was just a tiny baby um, when I was two years old then he set that up wow. and uh, you know he was successful in that so I kind of grew up in, relatively speaking uh, you know certainly I felt very privileged and um, we had a nice house and um, you know, I was, I was certainly really well looked after, and more importantly than that, well loved. You know, I mm -hmm. had an extremely loving upbringing. Um, and yeah, you know, I had a little brother, and, and yeah, we had a, a really um, fantastic, you know, loving upbringing. So I, I, again, I think that's been a big influence on me in the sense that it's really highlighted to me the kind of injustice um, of an issue like homelessness because the more I when we first met Pete and he asked us for a job and we gave him a job mm -hmm. then we um, he worked really hard and we decided to try it again and we asked Pete if he knew anybody else that was homeless and he suggested his brother Joe um, who was also selling the big issue so we took Joe on and another job came up and we asked them if they knew anybody else and they recommended a guy called John who was also selling the big issue, so we took John on and we started to meet more and more people um, who had been through this situation of homelessness. And we started to kind of ask them their stories and their journeys and their backgrounds. Um, and it became a bit eerie in the sense that we even were meeting lots and lots of people that found themselves in this situation as we started that shop, uh, Social Bite, and we kind of kept hearing the same story and it all originated kind of from the opposite end of the spectrum of a childhood to what I had and yeah. so typically they suffered really traumatic childhoods and suffered abuse uh, and, and largely speaking grew up through the care system and so they didn't have stable loving upbringing like, like I had experienced but many of them grew up in different children's homes and got bounced around different foster homes so suddenly the contrast in my own the cards I was dealt with the cards these people were dealt with came into really sharp focus mm -hmm. and it really highlighted to me the kind of sense of injustice with that. Um, so yeah, I think like definitely I've been massively influenced by my upbringing and I'm really aware of how lucky I've been. Mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly um, I, I think that if I had been dealt different cards then I would have probably been in an entirely different situation. So yeah. Yeah, I've kind of become increasingly aware of that really as I've got older. Right, okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Hmm. What would you say were your earliest um, career aspirations growing up? Um, I don't know, like uh, when I was younger I wanted to be a footballer, I suppose a lot yeah. of young boys did, I was supported Rangers and I used to love football and stuff so that was my first one. Then I wanted to be a journalist for a period of time. Um, I think when I got to a teenager um, I started to become a bit more politically engaged and a bit more like politically idealistic. Hmm. I remember, you know, I, I think I got into like bands like Rage Against the Machine and I started to really kind of want to become quite politically motivated. <laughs> and then in 2005, uh, the whole Live 8 thing mm -hmm. came around and Make Poverty History mm -hmm. campaign. Um, and I remember really getting uh, into that. And me and my, my brother won tickets in, in the newspaper to go down to London and see the Live 8 show. So me and him went down um, and saw it all and stuff. And... I was very impacted by that whole Make Poverty History campaign and I started to really think about um, these issues in the third world and, you know, think about poverty issues and that kind of thing and became increasingly motivated uh, in that sort of space. Um, and I think so I guess at the age of 14, 15, a teenager, um, I was starting to kind of have a very idealistic worldview and, and certainly my aspiration at that stage was to try and make a difference in some way. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember at the age of 17 um, I decided to try and do like an international volunteer project 
and I signed up to do this thing and I went out to Ecuador and for three months when I was 17 I just left high school and it was before university and I went away to Ecuador and did this project working with street children uh, in Ecuador so um, you know that was another kind of experience further entrenching that sense of what I wanted to do in this kind of space of trying to help people in some yeah. way um, and I remember coming back from Ecuador um, flying back and I was just you know so idealistic and I'm like I'm going to change the world and all this <laughs> and then I came back and I went to university and I studied politics and economics oh, right. largely with a view to try and get a career in that kind of thing mm -hmm. and it's over the five years of university um you know I know you went to uni yourself mm -hmm. the, you know there's a big drinking culture and mm. um, so suddenly you're getting drunk all the time you're making friends everything else so that sense of idealism idealism definitely kind of dissipated and and I kind of lost it over the course of five years and um, you know, coming out of university, um, yeah, I certainly didn't feel that same sense. And I, I still kind of wanted to do something in this space and making a difference. And my original aspiration upon leaving uni was to work for the government as like a civil servant. I wanted to be an economist mm -hmm. um, and stuff. So I applied for this job and that was my big plan. I was going to try and go to London and, and work as an economist for the government. And I went through this application process and ended up being not successful in getting the job. Um, so that kind of left me at a bit of a loose end. So I, I suppose, you know, after that, I was kind of, as I say, clutching at things, just almost trying to rediscover that same sense of like idealistic purpose that I had when I was 14, 15. Yeah. And it was almost when the social bite <laughs> thing happened. I was like, you know, I can cling on to this now. And this feels aligned with who I was from that age. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I don't know, I've had lots of different ambitions, but I'd say that was like a clear one when I became a teenager and I sort of rediscovered it almost when, when we set up socially. Mm -hmm. You see, I've, I've often heard people um, draw parallels between you and a young Che Guevara. Um, I mean, are you a revolutionary? How would you describe yourself? Well, that was like, the, uh, you know, such a I absolutely love that comparison. I've got like a picture of Che Guevara in my living room. Really? Um, and I always grew up, I went to Cuba uh, when I, with my mum and my brother years ago. Um, and you know, the, you see all the big Che Guevara things and they're smoking cigars and all that. So yeah. that was the first bit of like press that ever got written about me was a guy, it was a journalist called Brian Beacom for the Herald. Um, okay. And he came and interviewed me in Social Bite and blah, blah, blah. So I was just chatting away to him and answering his questions. And then he wrote this article and um, he said, oh yeah, he reminds me of a young Che Guevara and all this. So I was great because it just, I was said, my little brother was so jealous. I was like, Jack, look, I mean, compared to Che Guevara, and he's like, oh, no way, that's a disgrace. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it was, uh, you know, that was quite, quite cool. Um, but no, I don't know how much of a revolutionary I'm really. I, I wouldn't say anywhere near on the same spectrum as Che. Um, but, you know, at the same time, it's a flattering comparison, I guess, to, um, to think that in some way I'm trying to think differently to the, to the status quo and um, so yeah who knows but yeah certainly very flattered by that. Yeah yeah it's, it's an interesting comparison for sure it, you know I, I'll ask you this question because I've thought about this quite a mm. lot um, the issue of homelessness I, I think what you've done in order to address it is absolutely um, you know it's admirable it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. But whose core responsibility do you think it actually is to correct the homeless issue? Why should it take, you know, a young guy from a sort of privileged background mm -hmm. to have to, to take this on? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think, you know, it's, it's everyone's responsibility, really, um, mm. in different degrees. I think, you know, we can all do something about it, uh, any of us, you know, whether that's just speaking to someone and, uh, you know, treating them like a human being. If you see someone that's homeless that's begging or, or whatever, I think we can make a difference just by our interactions. Um, I think obviously there's a big homelessness charitable sector, a lot of uh, people doing amazing work long before I came along, uh, making a difference in that issue. Um, you know, and I think obviously the government has a fundamental role, be that local yeah. government at a city level or, or national government, I think ultimately if we are going to truly make a, a big inroad in this issue, it does come down to policy. Mm -hmm. um, so there's only so much any individual uh, or organisation could ever do. I suppose, you know, all that we can aim to do, me personally or, or Social Bite or as an organisation, is make a difference, you know, mm -hmm. and try and m move the dial a bit and, and stuff. So I feel proud of the things that we've done over the last six and a half years, you know, whether that's the sandwich shops. You know, I'm proud when I go in. I was in Rose Street shop yesterday um, and just seeing people that find themselves homeless coming in and getting a nice... Uh, 
coffee or a nice sandwich and just getting that sense of interaction with the staff and they all you know have such an appreciation for those shops those kind of humble salmon shops mm -hmm. i'm proud of that i'm proud of our work with the village and trying to uh, demonstrate a different uh, model for providing accommodation um, there i'm proud of our sleep in the park campaigns which i think really have hopefully moved the dial politically i yeah. think really they've shone the light on the issue mm -hmm. and there's been some pretty sizable uh, political commitments that have been made um, at local government and national government levels, all pretty directly off the back of those those events. Um, so yeah, you know, all that anyone can do is try and make a difference, and that's obviously our as an organisation our purpose. That's why we exist. That's why people support us. People donate money to us. Um, so I think it's our responsibility to try and maximise the impact we can make. But by all means, um, we can only ever go so far you know as, as a private organization as a charity yes. you know and ultimately i think it, it comes down to policy and to, to make the the big difference how far away do you think we are from eradicating homelessness in scotland and and what would need to change for it to be completely hmm. uh, cured i think that um you know so again when we started using that as a premise mm -hmm. uh, for the sleep in the park event and again we didn't set up social bite to eradicate homelessness. We mm. didn't even have much to do with homelessness. A young man who was homeless asked us for a job. So this wasn't some grand vision uh, from six and a half years ago. This mm -hmm. has been an organic evolution step by step. Um, and this notion of ending homelessness, you know, it only came about for us as an organization in terms of something that we could advocate for over the last couple of years. Okay. And that only really came about um, because we started to get a deeper understanding of the issue. Uh, we've got a deeper understanding of the statistics in Scotland and we've got a deeper understanding of some of the things that are happening in other countries um, where th the problem has been reduced or solved. Um, so one of the big countries that gives any nation, particularly a nation the size of Scotland, encouragement is uh, Finland. Mm. Um, so Finland is often cited as a big example in this in that they are a similar size nation to scotland and they did historically have a similar size homelessness problem to scotland um, but they now almost have no homelessness issue they've consistently driven those homelessness numbers down to the extent that homelessness in finland is more or less eradicated and wow. um, so if they can do it of course we can do it mm -hmm. um, it's simply a question of uh, prioritizing the issue politically is a question of focusing on it and it's a question of collaborating as a society um, to, to make that happen and the good thing is is because other countries like Finland have done it there's other cities that have made big inroads there's other policies that have been implemented historically in the UK that have, have clearly made a difference so we kind of know what works um, and I think there's room for innovation and try new things you know as well but also we kind of know what works uh, in different parts of the world so we kind of know if we implement the right policies and we put the right kind of political focus on the issue then we can make a big difference so i personally feel that scotland you know could certainly within the next five ten years drive those numbers down and um, to a practical level of zero and i think mm -hmm. the first steps have been taken on that journey um, and yeah why you know why couldn't we of, of course if you actually dig into the statistics, they're not so big that this is some fairy tale notion yeah. that we could have a country where no one should have to be homeless here. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Would you have thought ten years ago that what you have achieved to date would have been possible? And and what I mean by that is, how do you sort of deal with any limiting beliefs uh, in terms of do you have, you know, uh, is your view kind of massively? Um, based on like confidence like anything's possible or mm. when did you start to realize that the things that you could do were possible mm. good question i think i think a couple of things i think if you manage to like get yourself on a path where you feel completely aligned with who you are as a person with what you do day to day mm -hmm. then sometimes like like magic things happen like stars align kind of stuff yeah. you know the universe conspires in your favor Love that. and things that you couldn't have dreamed possible come your way and <laughs> doors open that you didn't even know there was a door there so i think like certain of it is some kind of spiritual notion that like if if you're feeling what you believe to be your purpose and you kind of get yourself on a path that you feel aligns with what you're here for, then things happen that you, you know, are out yeah. of your control or out with your ingenuity. Yeah. Um, so I think that's part of it. I think, you know, this, as I say, wasn't some big vision. It, but once 
we kind of decided to do a social business and open up this little sandwich shop and to have a social impact and Pete asked us for a job and we gave him one. Um, then all manner of events and things happened um, that we could never have predicted and certainly didn't plan for. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think there's that. The other element to it is that the whole entrepreneurial process, whether that's you know in the social space or another space, is simply for me about having some kind of idea in your head, some kind of vision of what you want to achieve, whether that's sell a particular product or open a sandwich shop or, you know, change your city or change the world. Um, you'll have a vision in your head about making something a reality. So the entrepreneurial process, and you've done it with you inspired Edinburgh, you've got your brand, you've got yeah, your, yeah. you've just done 76 interviews. At some point, none of this existed. This was just an idea in your head and now it's manifested into reality because you've worked hard to make that happen. And that's just the entrepreneurial process is seeing something that at one stage was only here, but manifesting into physical reality. Yeah. So as you get more experience, that's like anything, if you practice football every day for 10 years, you're going to get pretty good at football. And it's the same with that process. You can get increasingly experienced and increasingly confident in having something in here become real. And it starts quite small and you get more emboldened as you get some success with that. So, you know, this started for me with my events company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had an idea. We did lots of events, little business networking events. I did then I scaled up the ambition a bit and we did a exhibition at the SECC, uh, which is a snow sports exhibition. So we rented the SECC and mm -hmm. we decided to try and sell exhibition stands. And again, it was just an idea that we worked really hard to make happen and we sold the space and we advertised the tickets. And then at some point, there I was stood in the SECC um, at a ski and snowboard exhibition and it came true. <laughs> so suddenly your confidence emboldens a bit and then we went, thought maybe we could do a business awards ceremony and we did the Scottish Business Awards and uh, suddenly you're at the ICC and there's 800 business people there and you've created a business award ceremony yeah. hmm, this came true and then suddenly you think hmm, maybe we could get George Clooney to Scotland maybe we could get him into social bike and then next thing you know you're stood in your sandwich shop and the global paparazzi are outside and George Clooney's there and you think this is actually getting spooky that, that how <laughs> possible things are you know you kind of do have these limiting beliefs but they start to dissipate as you get more emboldened okay and um, you know so I think it's a it, it's a uh, self perpetuating process. As you get a bit of success with it, you kind of get increasingly confident, and you get a bit addicted to that process as well. So you kind of want almost how far can we can we keep pushing this? Yeah. Um, so yeah. That's fascinating, Josh. <laughs> how do you know when you're out of alignment? Um, I don't know. I think. I think um, it probably takes a bit of discipline to kind of keep yourself on a particular path. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, I think you can tell when you're in alignment because, as I say, magic things... Yeah, synchronicity and... Synchronicity happens. Yeah, yeah. You, you get signs. Things are clicking. Things are clicking. You know, if it, you think you really want to achieve something and it comes, your, you know, you really think, oh, if I want to get there, I need to, to do this. And then something miraculous will happen where that comes your way. Um, you know, so I think you can almost feel it. And also that I think, you know, everyone, I think, to some degree or another, has a sense of who they are as a person. And I think that's an important process. I spent a lot of time when I left uni, I read a load of self-development books, mm -hmm. you know, so I was got, like, got these Tony Robbins uh, tapes and I read like How to Win Friends and Influence People and Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and a lot of these key like staple like self-development things and yeah. I really took that really seriously and spent a lot of time like self-analyzing mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I wrote a load of st stuff from off the back of these books and stuck on my wall and envisaged on my deathbed. I thought that to me was a one of the exercises from this kind of self-development stuff that stuck with me. Yeah. One of these books, I can't remember which one it was, asks you to imagine it's your funeral and what would you want to have read in your uh, epitaph? Your obituary thing. Obituary. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's powerful. Yeah, and what, you know, really try and th close your eyes and think what would you have wanted to have achieved, what would you have wanted to have stood for, what would you have wanted to achieve from a family perspective and who would you have wanted to be as a person. I think 
everyone should spend time thinking about these questions and really trying to dig into who we all are as individuals. And I think that that's the important first step is understanding that. And then, and then the other, I think, key thing is it's very, very difficult to start doing something that's in alignment with that straight away. It doesn't click into place straight away. So I think, you know, as I described, trying to kind of feel something out, sometimes you pivot and change and things mm -hmm. don't work and you go onto a different path. And eventually you're kind of like, this is it, I can run with this. Um, so yeah, so I don't know. I, I don't think there's any science to it. And I think it's, who knows if it's true or if it's just kind of, I've just got really lucky maybe um, <laughs> over, over the years. And it's, there's that kind of um, thing that's called, um, confirmation bias yeah. you know what i mean where maybe it's just been a series of lucky strokes and, I'm, <laughs> and now i've got these kind of spiritual views that make all come crashing down one day that could also be the case but i don't know certainly it feels to me too many amazing things have happened to me personally that i've got quite a firm belief in this more spiritual sense of yeah. alignment or whatever it is but yeah who knows? for sure yeah it, it's darren brown did uh it was one of his episodes that i watched and it was taking, I can't even remember exactly how it was, but it was basically somebody who had a positive outlook and somebody who had a negative outlook. Mm -hmm. And there was just certain things that would happen with, to the positive person, like they'd find a 50 pound note on the ground, for yeah. example, whereas the negative person wouldn't mm -hmm. because they're they're tuned into a different frequency, yeah. if you like. Definitely. And things, it's like, because we're all ultimately energy and you can look into the metaphysics of it. hundred percent. Positive it's attracts positive, Definitely, hundred percent. There's stuff, I, I don't understand it fully, but I feel it, you know, that I yeah. feel there's something beyond our comprehension. Yes. Darren Brown's incredible. All the stuff he does is beyond all of our comprehension, but he's tapping into some other frequencies mm -hmm. um, that do exist. And I think that there's, there's definitely some higher powers at play yeah. out there um, that, that most of us, including myself, don't understand. Mm. Um, but mm. I think definitely, um, yeah, there's there's a sense, certainly in, in my experience, if you kind of read, the other thing is about this notion of commitment. And uh, I remember on our first ever Business Awards event, we had Bob Geldof speak, mm -hmm. um, and I've kept in touch with Bob, and he supported us on some different things. And he always finishes his talks with this quote about commitment, and it's a really fantastic quote. And he relayed it to his experience with Live Aid, where once he'd launched it and it had all blown up, um, he felt like out of his depth and he felt, you know, can, is this going to work? If it didn't, then uh, it would have been, the humiliation would have been horrific for him, but also even more profound because of the people that he was proposing that the event would help yeah. um, in this you know, situation of famine. And he relayed this quote from a guy called... Uh, W. H. Murray, who's a Scottish mountaineer, okay. um, but it's a quote about commitment, uh, and um, it kind of the point of it is, is that it's only once we commit. So once we've kind of stepped off the cliff to beyond the point of no return, hmm. that that's when the synchronicity happens, and that's when things, f you know, come our way that we could have never dreamed of, and events conspire that we could have never dreamed of. But you'll never get that unless you kind of go past the commit to be on the point of no return and um, so i think that's also true is it's you can't sort of sit on the fence and expect things to conspire yeah um, you know so yeah who knows it's all kind of spiritual uh yeah, sense yeah. That I, I don't understand <laughs> it but i definitely feel i love it i definitely feel uh, there's something that's to it yeah. definitely yeah. yeah and that's a great piece of advice actually yeah. i really like that you mentioned your obituary um which mm. i think is a super powerful exercise mm. What would you like yours to read? Um, I don't know, to be honest, but I think certainly, um, you know, made a difference. I think that's the main thing is, uh, and I, I think I always, in terms of my personal path, I want to commit my life to try and in some way, um, you know, look out for and help people and make a difference to people that are excluded from the system in whatever way. So again, I found a natural um, space for that in the issue of homelessness. You know, the, yeah. I think within the country we live in and the society we live in in a lot of Western countries, these are arguably the most excluded demographic of people, um, you know, in Scotland and, and further afield. So I think it's a, it's a cruel, cruel society. Um, if you find yourself in that situation and the system that isn't really geared up 
um, to make life better for you. And mm -hmm. I think quite often people in that situation feel really invisible. And that's a common bit of feedback we get from people is they don't feel like human beings. They feel completely invisible um, and ignored, not just by other citizens, but ignored politically um, and so on and so forth. So I think, you know, definitely I want to commit my life to trying to give a voice um, and just work hard to m make a difference to people in that situation or other situations, um, you know, where people f are a bit excluded from mm -hmm. the system that, as we know it, and, you know, certain didn't have the cards that I was lucky enough to be dealt, you know, when I came into the world. Yeah, yeah. I've got two questions, mm -hmm. um, if I can remember them, which should kind of link to one another. So the first one is really how, what's the most common reason that people become homeless, but also in what way can you, um, like, reintegrate homeless people within normal society? Um, I think, the, like, w w as I say, we started to employ people that were homeless mm -hmm. and then we introduced this pay it forward system so yeah. customers could buy food ahead for homeless people to come and get later so people started buying extra coffees and extra soups and extra sandwiches and then we started to invite homeless people in and um, so at reached the stage we're maybe engaging whether the, through the employment or through giving the free food with 40 50 homeless people every day and where we could and where we got chatting to people we asked them their stories and how they became homeless and it became really eerie to us, almost a bit spooky, in the sense that we probably had a preconception that homelessness was as a result of people in some way making bad decisions. You know, so again, a lot of people feel this way um, that are, you know, they're just alcoholics or drug addicts, or in some way they've made bad decisions that resulted in them in that situation of being homeless. But where it became a bit spooky is that almost everyone we asked, no matter who it was we asked, basically just kept telling us the same story of how they ended up there. And it always started in childhood. It always started with, well, I suffered abuse when I was a kid, you know, or suffered some kind of trauma mm -hmm. when, I was, when I was a kid. I grew up in the care system, you know, I bounced around different children's homes and I became homeless when I was 16. Or some variation of, of that journey was incredibly common and um, so be really quickly became re apparent uh, to me that homelessness wasn't a result of individual decision making it was very systemic mm -hmm. um, and depending on what cards people got dealt if they were dealt particularly bad cards mm -hmm. it was almost predestined you know society was set up in a way and we society wasn't intervening in childhood in a way it was almost predestined they were going to end up in this pretty horrific space and if you end up homeless 16 17 then how is that your fault you know you're still a kid basically yeah and then you find that it's even crueler because when someone does end up there at that stage society really kind of turns its back and people get increasingly stigmatized and yeah. it's like, oh, you know junky um, or whatever mm. and your chances of kind of breaking back into the mainstream are pretty remote and um, so you know, when we took Pete on and uh, as that first employee from a homeless background, he'd previously come from selling the big issue uh, outside the shop, as I say. And uh, when he got that job, the local paper picked up the story, Edinburgh News picked up a story and they ran this full page, like local good news story mm -hmm. um, that Pete uh, had been selling the big issue outside the shop and now he's got a job inside the shop and it's a good news story. And that was our first bit of PR that a social bite we ever kind of got. And went, oh, well. And then the next day after that, it was a bit strange in the sense that all of the national newspapers picked up that story. So the Sun and the Daily Record and the Herald and the Scotsman, they all ran a big story. Again, good news story about Pete selling the biggest show outside the shop. Now he's got a job inside the shop. And again, we're thinking, well, you know, well, this might help us build this business. Blah, blah, blah. But in hindsight, I look back on that and I think, it's so uh, telling of the the, the 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 crux of this situation in the sense that how on earth is a bit strange that how on earth is that a news story because if you think about it all that really happened was a young able person went from selling a magazine to washing dishes that was a story but it got national news coverage because it's so rare you know someone breaking into the mainstream even just a dishwasher from a situation of homelessness is, is is such a rare occurrence that it made that kind of news yeah and i think that's the kind of cruel reality for, for these people is that they get dealt these horrific cards they end up homeless probably in their late teenage years and it's almost impossible for them to 
get out of that kind of stigmatised, marginalised, impoverished uh, situation. And I think that's not their fault, that's society's fault. Yeah, yeah. It also seems like a rarity that the mainstream media would actually pick up on a positive story and, you know, put that out there. To an extent, there. yeah. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Which I mean, is refreshing. Yeah, well, I think we've be, they've been really kind to us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've had a lot of coverage. Phenomenal, and it's yeah. always been really positive mm -hmm. uh, by and large. So, you know, I kind of, again, feel lucky that we've kind of been, uh, certainly had, had a lot of support. And again, it's... Um, something that you kind of be wary of sometimes the media but at the same time it can also be a fantastic benefit uh, and it's certainly given us a platform to be able to fundraise and to achieve some of the things we've gone on to achieve yeah. um, you know the media profile we've received has been definitely a big help in it mm -hmm. yeah i like it what have you learned from meeting the likes of Bill Clinton, Richard Branson, Leonardo DiCaprio, George Clooney, Michelle Obama, like the list goes on, you know? Um, <laughs> I think, number one, it was just like great fun, like incredible exp life experiences um, yeah. to, to, to bring these kind of people over to Scotland. Um, you know, I think the Clooney and the DiCaprio ones particularly were just it's totally surreal and like, you, you know, I'll never forget those, those days. Um, you know, the Clooney one, when he obviously came into Social Bite and the sort of world's global media was pitched outside our uh, shop on Rose Street and there was a Sky News truck parked around the corner and, um, you know, Clooney's car pulls up and there's about 200 women that have been camping out since like six in the morning just to see him going berserk. And I'm just stood there like inside Social Bite thinking, you know, almost uh, however long, three and a half years ago, I was in here frantically making sandwiches, you know, worried that we we're going to uh, meet payroll next week. Just thinking this is just surreal. You know, it was a mad, surreal experience. And it was a transformative one for Social Bite, you know, as an organisation. I think um, the kind of suddenly everyone knew what, who we were and what we did, and I think it brought profile certainly to Social Bite as an organisation, but also to the issue of homelessness. It really stimulated conversation mm -hmm. and, uh, and debate around the issue of homelessness and so on and so forth. So I think you know there's tremendous power in, in celebrity and these kind of figures um, just popping in for ten minutes um, to, to our sandwich shop. What a tremendous! impact that made and I, I often think would we realistically have been able to pull off something like sleep in the park um, and have 8,000 people give up their beds and, and raise four million pounds or would we realistically have been able to mobilize a project like the village and to, you know get all the support that was required uh, to, to make that a reality without those high profile visits preceding it mm. probably not you mm -hmm. know in all reality so I think there's certain, it's certainly been incredibly transformative for us as an organization. Yeah. And also like, just to, like Clooney, for example, was the most charming man I've ever met. Like he was an absolute legend yeah. um, and he was fantastic with the staff. Like he t gave his whole day, um, so generous with his time, so charming, so funny. Hmm. Uh, at the, the business awards event he spoke at, he had 2000 people you know, eating out of the palm of his hand. and just like a master class. It was everything you would hope he would have been. Yeah. Um, and so on. And, and you know, they've all got their own foundations, these guys. So even DiCaprio, it was brilliant to hear about his work in climate change. Clooney is um, working in the Sudan and uh, human rights, really pretty uh, hard hitting issues there. So it's fascinating to like do this, uh, to, to, to have had those experiences. Uh, and, you know, it's not something that really we have any further engagement as dips into our world and then kind of the next day things just resume to normal but it's been incredible kind of surreal experiences and yeah definitely again feel grateful for them yeah yeah in what way do you think josh today is different from josh in 2011 um i think i don't know as i say you kind of you built you're gaining confidence i think i'm more confident yeah. now i think mm -hmm. um for, from each bit of success, each milestone that you reach, you kind of become a bit more emboldened and a bit more confident. I think definitely I've got much less fear around 
what I can achieve. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of feel like the sky's the limit in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly I feel, um, yeah, you know, a sense of personal like power in that regard. Like I don't see too many barriers to, to trying to achieve something or get something done. Um, so, yeah, as I say, that's an embold been emboldened over the years by all the little things that have happened. Yeah. Um, and maybe one day, you know, it comes crashing down and, uh, you know, something we try doesn't work. But I think certainly I, I feel a much more confident person. Um, I'm probably a happier person, as I say. Mm -hmm. I, I think it leads to a sense of personal happiness when you feel more aligned with with, with what you're doing. Um, so, yeah. What does the future hold for you, Josh? Where do you see yourself going longer term? You know, I still, I've still got a few kind of big ambitious things uh, we want to do. Um, we've got a, a, a ambitious plan for this year, which I can't really tell you about. Okay. Because it's sort of secret. Sure, moment. sure. Um, but yeah, certainly like got some ambitious plans. I think like one of the challenges for me that I think is that, as I say, this whole th entrepreneurship thing and all the rest is very addictive. So, and it's, it can be very all consuming. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're thinking about it, going to bed and you wake up and, you know, you're in the office late and, you know, so you just achieve that thing and then you're on to the next thing. Yeah. And that's a thrill in lots of ways, but also um, it doesn't leave much for a lot of other things in life. Um, so I think definitely for me, I've felt um, a lack of balance in my life, you know, as for over the last 10 years, uh, as we've kind of been doing all these things, it's been very, quite all consuming. Mm -hmm. So I think like in a way, a, an aspiration for me personally is to redress that a bit and uh, mm -hmm. try and um, make sure I've got other areas to my life as well. Okay. Make sure that I've, um, you know, hopefully one day I'll have a family and I don't want to be like absent. You yeah. know, so I want to like make sure that that's a priority. I want to make sure that like I exercise and like don't neglect that side. I want to make sure that I have fun and like don't like not see my friends and all mm -hmm. this kind of stuff. So I feel like balance it, it, to me hopefully will become a priority. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, you can't just be lost. I don't want to be like Richard Branson and wake up at 60 and have you know, 50 things I've set up and it just never ends. Yeah. You know, I want to try and um, make sure that, uh, you know, I'm still aligned with what I want to do and everything else, but that there's a, there's certainly a balance in my life. Hopefully that's, that's my, one of my big objectives. How close are you to uh, achieving your, your biggest goals? Pretty close. I think, um, I think it's, you know, so in terms of like social bite, mm -hmm. um, um, I think one of the things I'm really proud of is that we set up a a, a program um, which is known as Housing First. So this is what they did. I mentioned Finland mm -hmm. have um, more or less eradicated homelessness mm -hmm. there. And the way they've done that is through a strategy called Housing First and uh, like rapid rehousing. So what that basically means is that the status quo at the moment in Scotland and the UK and a lot, lot of Western countries is that if you find yourself becoming homeless, so this, say you find yourself becoming homeless tomorrow in Edinburgh, then you would go and present to Edinburgh Council and they have a homelessness office. You would go and you say, I've been made homeless. You would then be, the council in the UK has a statutory obligation so that you should have some kind of shelter. Um, okay. So you shouldn't have to sleep rough. There's instances you may have to sleep rough, but legally speaking, there's a statutory obligation. You should have some kind of shelter. So this has led to the creation of like a homelessness system. So this means that there's all these things that have been set up. Largely big hostels um, are the other ones are these privately owned bed and breakfasts, um, which are typically run for profit, privately owned, and the council commissions these companies to run these bed and breakfasts. And it's not like a bed and breakfast like a, for tourists, but it's a bed and breakfast specifically designed for homeless people that tends to be um, pretty horrific. You get a single bed and you get a kettle and that's it. And you're kind of given curfew, so you have to be out there at nine in the morning. You can't get back into six at night. You have to be in before half ten at night if you miss that curfew at night then you'll get kicked out of that b and your bags will be there waiting for you at the door you have to take your stuff you might sleep rough that night you'll represent and you'll go and be placed in another b and or alternatively you might be in a big hostel with 50 other 
homeless guys who varying degrees of addiction and complex needs and mental health problems and it's a big quite a horrible you know traumatic experience really mm. so that's the homelessness system by and large is these kind of homelessness specific largely unsupported accommodations and the average waiting time in edinburgh and um, in that kind of homelessness system before you go on to get your own flat is typically between 12 and 18 months and um, some cities in the uk it's much longer than that sometimes it's two years or whatever so you can imagine yourself if you were in a situation where you became homeless mm. say you slept rough so you're pretty traumatized probably with that experience the insecurity mm. and then you get put in a hostel um with 50 other guys and addictions rife and you bullying's rife and you feel you know pretty unsecure and then maybe you get put in a and b and you're you don't have a job so you're kind of kicked out all day and you're sort of traipsed in the streets then how quickly would it take for your mental health to deteriorate like how different a person would you be in two weeks mm -hmm. of that experience how different would you be in a month how different would you be in two years and mm -hmm. what chance after two years have you got of reintegrating to society of getting a job and so on and so forth you know mm -hmm. so what we're doing by putting people into this system is kind of cutting them adrift and it's really failing them that wouldn't all be so bad if it wasn't so expensive like it costs us as council taxpayers and, and national government taxpayers an insane amount of money to fund this so it's, this isn't a cheap solution and there's a lot of money multi-millions of pounds being funneled into private pockets and people are multi-millionaires uh, off the back of this system so this is the system not just in edinburgh but in throughout the uk and, and beyond and this is a system that kind of perpetuates homelessness mm -hmm. at great expense so one of the things i'm really proud about in terms of uh, what social bite have done um with our sleep in the park campaigns and with the money raised from these campaigns is we've initiated a big uh, alternative model to that which is known as housing first so what housing first proposes is that rather than people going into the system at all if you were to find yourself becoming homeless then we should try and structure our society in a way where we say okay we've got a mainstream flat for you so it's not a homeless f place this is a mainstream one bedroom flat and it's yours but you might have pretty complex needs so maybe you've never had a flat before maybe you do have a drug addiction or an alcohol addiction maybe you've got pretty severe anxiety issues mental health issues where if we just said okay we've got a flat for you there's the keys then you are likely maybe to not sustain that flat yeah. it's maybe unfurnished or maybe you know you you struggle you miss your rent you have problems with the neighbors so on and the flat falls through and you end up homeless again so that's the reason that doesn't typically happen so what housing first suggests is we should be funding and investing in a wraparound support for people and um, so rather than spending all this money on these hostels and b&b's and everything else we should be reinvesting those funds in trying to get people into mainstream housing and providing a support for them Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I'm really proud that Social Bite have initiated a program uh, around that, um, a big housing first program, and we've got 830 flats have been pledged throughout wow. five cities in Scotland. Um, and from the monies we raised at Sleep in the Park, we're putting £3 million in to fund that wraparound support. And the Scottish Government have committed £6.5 million, so there's like a big like £9.5 million pound funding pot to fund this support for people in these 830 flats. and. Beyond that, then it's up to the state then almost, it's up to the national and local government to expand that program and to really fully reorientate the system mm -hmm. and ultimately disband these B&Bs, get rid of them, get rid of the hostels, clo you know, close them down um, and reorientate the system towards this kind of strategy, which is what Finland have done. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and I'm really proud that through the Sleep in the Park campaigns and really grateful to all the thousands of people that gave up their beds and took part in that, that that's been a direct result of it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I feel like, you know, I've only ever took things kind of one year at a time. And um, so I don't know entirely what year on year will bring. We've never mm. had a long term vision, but um, I feel certainly that's a big thing achieved that, that I feel proud of. And yeah, we'll need to see what's next. Incredible. Hmm. What do you feel your purpose is in life? Um, as I say, for me, it's that whole obituary thing of trying to think what you would want read on at your funeral um you know so i guess a bit morbid but it bit works. morbid yeah you know so just just to make a difference really and you know hopefully i guess purposes will change as well maybe mm -hmm. i have a family my purpose will become about my kids and my mm -hmm. family and all that so i guess maybe it changes but certainly um 
you know, just to make a difference in, in some way. Hmm. I'd normally ask what you want your legacy to be, but that's kind of covered implicitly in that. <laughs> um, how do you define success? Um, I think that's like an important question as well. Um, in the sense, in the sense that that's my definition of success has kind of led me down this path. So, like one of the things, uh, and again, a few newspaper articles kind of picked up when I've ever have like mentioned this, is that because my dad was really successful in business, um, in his restaurants and stuff, then. Again, I felt I grew up in certainly a relatively privileged situation. Didn't have mega money, but it was like in a relative sense compared to. Um, I went to a state school, um, so compared to a lot of other people in the school, I, I, I guess I had a relative degree of privilege, and I was always m really mortified by that. So I, was, I guess, like any kid, you want to fit, fit in at school. Mm -hmm. So if anything identifies you as being different, then you don't want you don't want anyone to know that because you you don't want to be left out of friendship groups or whatever else so mm. i was always mortified that um if my dad would drop me off at school in a fancy sports car or anything i think find that's just the worst thing ever so <laughs> really, yeah. make him like drop me off around the corner and i'd walk <laughs> in and stuff because i would hate to be thought of in that way that's really um, interesting. so yeah so i've never defined success as money because i've always wanted to yeah. kind of like not be associated with money really um so yeah, like ever since certainly I was a teenager, of all my success to me was always trying to make a difference or you know trying to follow your dreams yeah. or that kind of thing. So that's led me to make probably career choices um, that have, have led me down a particular path. But certainly, like a, relatively early on in, in kind of this entrepreneurial journey, I managed to sort of switch off the button in my brain that defines success as money, and I think like. When that button goes off, a whole load of other th opportunities come up um, because you're not thinking in those linear kind of patterns about trying to maximise a financial return and that opens up a whole load of new doors. Um, yeah. So I'd encourage particularly any younger people um, that might be listening to this, people leaving education, going into the world, I think like if you can turn off that button that doesn't just look at the earnings league tables and doesn't just think about maximising a financial return, it can really open up exciting other paths for you in life. Yeah, definitely, definitely. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Um, hmm, I think my dad used to always tell me when I was younger, um, you know, you can do whatever you set your mind to. That kind of stuck with me. And I think I'm sure influenced me. It's um, a very, very good life philosophy. I think so, you know, and again, <laughs> you get increasingly confident in that as you have a bit of success and achieve certain milestones. Yeah. And as I say, I've become increasingly emboldened in that. But I think to have that instilled in me from a young age, again, was really lucky. And I think a lot of people have more limiting beliefs instilled in them um, from parents or from whatever. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, you can achieve, achieve anything you set your mind to is, is a good one. I think uh, I heard... Uh, in my speeches that I give and stuff, I always used to finish with a quote from Steve Jobs, um, which I just kind of think sums up that whole idea. Um, and he, so what he said is, is that everything around us that we call life was made up by people that are no smarter than us. Mm -hmm. um, and we can change it and influence it and we can build our own things that other people can use. And he said, shake off this erroneous notion that life is just there and you're just going to live in it versus embrace it and change it. Um, so yeah, I thought like, you know, that's kind of sums it up really, um, that everything around us that we call life, you know, was just made up by other human human beings. Exactly. So why can't we uh, change things a bit? So true, so true. Mm -hmm. He was a, a wise guy. <laughs> <laughs> if you had the opportunity to speak to your 20 year old self, what would you say? Um, I'm trying to think what I was doing at 20. I was at uni, I think. It would probably just be... Um, Stop you know, drinking. Yeah, just ease up on the booze a bit, you know. <laughs> take a night off. Um, yeah. <laughs> definitely. You know, I don't know, but I think you can never... Uh, I don't think you can live really with regrets or mm. or anything about any particular period of time. I think it all shapes you, and, you know. Again... I made a lot of fantastic friends at uni and had some brilliant laughs and everything else. So, 
Um, but yeah, certainly, maybe ease up in the booze a bit wouldn't have been a bad idea. Do you have any regrets at all? I can I don't know, not really, in terms of even mistakes you make kind of um, in some ways shape you or put you on a, on a different path. And mm-hmm. so, again, something like I think things in a way seem to happen for a reason. So, um, you know, my when I left uni, I originally wanted to get a job for the government and I would have given anything for that job, you know, mm. and I was so gutted when I didn't get it. And I went, it was a six month long applicate grad scheme application process. And, mm. you know, I was so invested in getting it. And then, you know, as I say, gutted when I didn't and at a loose end. And now I look back now and think if I'd got that job, it probably could would have been the worst thing that could have ever happened to me and I've been really confined within this bureaucratic structure and probably very stifled um, yeah. and my life would be in an entirely different place um, so you know I think s- sometimes you just have to roll with life and th- even things that seem uh, like a curse might later turn out to be a bit of a blessing yeah yeah I love the whole idea of the kind of butterfly effect or sliding doors yeah could have been corporate Josh that's what I mean definitely <laughs> Definitely, it's just, it's mad how your life takes twists and turns and things can change. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like, it, I could have easily gone down a path of, be it that, or I could have ended up in a corporate career and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, you know, who, kn- who knows? Uh, but yeah. <laughs> Last question for you, Josh, it's a big one. If you could change anything in the world, mm-hmm. what would it be and why? I guess for me, like I would probably change um, the definition of success. I think you know if people, I think we could change the world pretty quickly in a positive way in terms of the big issues that we face, whether that's poverty, homelessness, climate change, um, you know all the big issues that we face as a society. I think as a human race, we could rapidly alter all these things for the the positive and we could rapidly make inroads in these issues and ultimately support people you know that find themselves in these more desperate situations because the power of like human creativity and the human mind is like phenomenal Mm -hmm. Um, and I think if you look at some of the human achievements whether technological or industrial you know it's incredible what how life changes generation to generation and how two generations ago you know, our grandparents could have probably never envisaged the world as it is today. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think because the defini- de- definition of success is focused around money, yeah. then that results in certain demographics of society kind of being left behind. Um, so whilst we're making all these incredible advancements, people's creativity by and large doesn't focus on some of these challenges. Um, and I think... If, if people were more inclined to view success as helping someone that needed it or uh, making a difference or tackling this massive issue that we face um, and success was defined in that way, then, uh, you know, by people focusing on these issues and doing something about them, we can make a, a big difference. Um, so, yeah, if I, you know, if I had a magic wand that could change something, it would be the everyone leaving university and this next generation coming through would all just be th- putting their brains to these issues and not putting their brains to how to earn the most money or, you know, so on and so forth. And then I think we could, you know, make, make a big, big difference. Mm-hmm. I'm just thinking in terms of the challenges around that. I mean, we ultimately need money to survive mm. in the way that the system is currently yeah, set up. I yeah. mean, what are your thoughts around that? You know, but I think that's true. And I think, you know, the other thing is social bite have massively benefited from philanthropy from Mm. corporate companies supporting us so on and so forth so i think um that 100 percent. but i don't think the two things necessarily are like mutually exclusive either Mm -hmm. so i think like even someone that's made a lot of money in business or whatever i think when they start to earn their creative attentions to philanthropic efforts or if i was you know uh, people i deal with ceos of big corporate companies or banks or whatever, the minute they start putting their brains to um, sleep in the park or supporting social bite or so on and so forth, then that's when we can start to see some big benefits for our organisation. So I think mm-hmm. even if it's not people 
100% of their focus uh, on more social issues. I think if people just certainly, you know, switch their attention to it, at least to some degree, and certainly for young people leaving education, I think young people are so um, typically motivated and tend to be quite idealistic in these kind of things. And I think as a society, we typically funnel them through a system which forces them to lose it and kind of forces them down particular corporate paths or particular career progression paths where some of the more idealistic notions they had kind of dissipate as yeah, minded. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think if we could harness that a bit more and try and get the younger generation coming through, mm -hmm. putting their creative minds to these kind of things, I think to me that's important. Definitely. Awesome. Josh, I've honestly loved having you here. I know you need to watch your time, so uh, we'll wrap things up. But yeah, I've, I've absolutely loved speaking with you. Oh, likewise, man. Thanks so much for the invite. It's Thanks. an absolute pleasure. And uh, maybe at some stage in the future, we'll get you back for a, a, a two and a half hour job. Sure, man, definitely. <laughs> Josh, thank yeah. you so much. Sure, man. Thank Cheers. you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs>